so our next speaker is Dr. Eva Brisman. She has a PhD in the history of religions from Lund University in Sweden. Her work relates to religion and ecology and the intersection between dark green religion and environmentalism in relation to climate change and the loss of biodiversity, as well as landscapes and local lore. And she will be speaking to us about tree lore in the Anthropocene, the order of bards, ovates, and druids as oak seers in times of ecological crisis. So welcome, Dr. Brisman. So, can I be heard now? Good. Yes. I have a slide, so I will share it with you. So, I'm participating from Sweden, so it's comfortable Sunday evening, yeah, afternoon. So, this is the one. Um, yes, I will take it from the beginning. The very first one. Um, All right. If you have... Yep. Um, do you have a PowerPoint? Because nothing's coming up. We're just seeing you. Okay. So Something. you need to pull up and then hit share. No, I think I didn't open it before. I didn't take it through this one. Share screen. I just opened yep. it. I think you got there it now. Yes. Fine. Yeah. That's good. And so then just do... Um, uh, mm -hmm. You got it. That's perfect. Good. Yes. Uh, so I'm working with um, relation to environmentalism and dark green religion, it could be say. So paganism is part of that um, field, you could say. Uh, and I've been looking especially at, at Britain. I did my PhD there and I live in Sweden. So it's um, kind of close to, to go there. Uh, but this is, uh, I will look at Fraser, um, I will, he talks about what he called worship of trees. Uh, and I will relate that to what I call modern tree lore, uh, to, to have this, not really uh, just to compare them, but to have a conversation with Fraser kind of. Uh, and so, I will ask how that ancient phenomena that Fraser described can be set in relation to a contemporary context and the discourse on ecology and the, in the Anthropocene. And the Anthropocene is a concept that is central in environmental humanities. So it's, it's, it addresses the new geological age that we are living in, where humanity has become a, a geological force. So I, I used uh, the Anthropocene uh, a little bit like uh, in contrast to antiquity, which phrase you use. So that's why you're using it. And it's also a, a, con a concept that is very central in environmental humanities. So that's a little bit part of my vocabulary. Um, but if you look at Fraser, if we start with him, and his comparative religions, uh, what he's doing is, is that he's trying to do in the Golden Boar is to try to form a, uh, uh, um, try to, to do in his comparative me method. I really have this uh, before the text now. Could I move them a little or something? Because I can't see the text because this squares faces up here. Maybe I can, yeah, that's good. Uh, so James Fraser, uh, and he called it a general work on primitive superstition and religion. Uh, and he called his method comparative religion. And then it's quite uh, straightforward forward because what he's doing is from all these cases, he finds a common motive, find a common feature, and he establishes a phenomena. So, um, and this has, of course, been, been criticized. Uh, but what he's doing is that that he's he's establishing this phenomena, and the one I will address is the worship of trees. Uh, so, when you talk about the worship of trees. Uh, He's, 
he uh, dedicated a chapter to this and he talks about the northern Europe, he talks about uh, Germany and British islands, uh, and he talk about uh, southern uh, Europe, Italy, Greece, and he, then he talks also about India and African religion, so he, he moves around the world, but I will look at what he's saying about Europe, uh, and uh, uh, especially, of course, in relation to, to Britain, what is nowadays in Britain. But what he says in, in, in The Golden Boar is, and I will read, nothing could be more natural, for at the dawn of history, Europe was covered with immense primeval forests in which scattered clearings must have appeared like iceless in an ocean of green, end quote. So he, he, he claims that... Um, Worship of tree is natural because these people live in landscapes that are woodlands. Um, and he sees all these various um, examples. And the ancient druids are one of those. Uh, and in, in all these many cases, he find a common feature, and that is trees as animated. Uh, so the worship of trees is based in an animated word view. And he also go on to, to write this one when he elaborates on, on this word, animus, on trees and animus. And I will quote, but it's necessary to examine in some detail the notion on which the worship of trees and plants is based. To the savage, the words in general is animate and trees and plants are no exception to the rule. He thinks that they have souls like his own, he treats them accordingly. For why the slaughter of an ox or sheep should be of a greater wrong than felling of a fire or oak, seeing that the soul is implemented in these trees also. Uh, so what he says there is that trees are not only that they are animated, but he also said that the trees holds a spirit or a soul and the felling of a tree is like the killing of an animal. Uh, and he pictures this out a little bit problematic uh, because it's not simply cutting down trees, it's the killing of a tree. Uh, and uh, if we assume that trees are like um, a living creature, this indicates that we ought to treat them with some respect. Uh, and uh, this is something that is very strong in a com contemporary context, where we have uh, animism and ideas about animated trees. But in a contemporary discourse in relation to ecological and ethical uh, discourse, uh, we have this that the animistic uh, perspective is the basis for to have an ethical relation to trees. Uh, that we ought to have um, green concerns or more eco-friendly approach to trees. Um, and this is also very much in, into environmental humanities, uh, when, when scholars look at this, uh, that we ought to have a more, uh, what is often referred to an ecocentric eco view on nature, that will be the basis for a eco, eco, more ethical treatment of, of nature. Uh, and one scholar who is said to be the first to, to make the environmental turn, a historian that starts to look at um, um, our use of nature, our uh, re religion and ecology, is Lynn White, who is a historian in, in an American historian, and in 1962, he wrote an article when he talk, contrast, he was looking for the roots of the ecological crisis. And he says that uh, Western Christianity has part of this, and uh, in contrast to pagan animism, which he pictured as more eco-friendly. Uh, and I'm going to read this, what he write about what in antiquity, because he echoes a lot about James Fraser, I think. So I quote, in antiquity, every tree, every spring, every stream, every hill had its own genus loci, its guardian spirits. These spirits were accessible to men, but were unlike men, kentaurs, fauns, and mermaids, 
show their um, amb ambivalence. Before one could cut a tree, mine a mountain, or dam a brook, it was important to placate that spirit in charge of the particular situation and to keep it placated. By destroying pagan animism, Christianity made it possible to exploit nature in a mood of indifference to the feeling of natural objects. So in this, pagan animism uh, become almost a more eco-friendly perspective um, towards nature. Uh, and this is something that we can find example of today as well. Uh, and I will look at modern druidy in Britain. Um, and I will look at the order of bards, druids, uh, order of, of uh, uh, bards, oviates, and druids. And I will say order of bards for shorts for the rest, because it's a very long name. But I will give a short uh, historical background from Druids, and then I also will refer to what Fraser says about ancient Druids, uh, because he also referred to them as oak worshipper, uh, who, and there he said that their sanctuary seemed to be identical with the grove of woodland. Uh, and it's familiar that the oak has a central place in ancient Celtic mythology. And there are also sources like classical writers who give historical records of Druids as oak seers worshipping in groves. Uh, and then etymology of the word Druids draws the connection between the Druid and the oak. Uh, and also the modern scholar says that it's a Celtic word for oak combi combined with the Indo-European uh, word wid which is to know. So taking together, uh, a druid is a wise man of the oak or wise person of the oak. Um, and I will look at the order of the bards, as, as I said, uh, and I will also see that, um, I will look at a, a special one thing because one thing that I have done um, uh, is, to uh, engage in, in uh, protecting trees. So first I will um, look at what they say about it, because they also make use about the historical use of uh, druid, modern druid as oak sayers. Uh, and they we have this that they, so to speak, uh, refer to the history and the say, historical druids um, but they do not have any claims of continuity between them. Nonetheless, they, they refer to this uh, as, as uh, oak stairs, uh, referring to, to uh, growth uh, in Britain, but they also see themselves as a modern form of druidy. Uh, and they are also uh, talk about the role of trees in relation to various forms of tree law. Um, and this is, it, you cannot simply say that what they're doing is simply worship, uh, because they also do other things in relation to the ecological concern and protection of woods in the UK. Um, I will compare once more the ancient uh, time, which phrase the picture, because he pictures England in ancient times as a woodland. And um, he said that. It was natural to, to worship trees because it was a woodland. Um, and he pictured England in medieval time where there were royal forests, um, as many as 68 one. And he write how a squirrel might leap from one tree to, to another. Uh, but today when they talk about uh, England and they talk about forests, it's a thematic of the loss of forests that is a very predominant. Uh, and uh, there is one man who is named Peter Frinnes, who is written uh, on, about this. And, is, and he says he's a nature writer and environmentalist. And he says, quoting, today we have less woodland cover than almost any other European country, despite four decades of hard planting by the Woodland Trust and other dictated charities, end quote. So this is, of course, a great difference between historical druids and contemporary. Uh, and 
Also, what the Order of Bonds has done is um, that they have participated in a great appeal for protecting uh, forests in Britain. Uh, and there was a great uh, national um, campaign uh, that was initiated by the Woodland Trust that is named the Charter of Trees, Woods and People. And it was launched in 2017. Uh, and they have formulated nine principles for a society in which people and trees can stand strong together and will guide their future. And they also say that they are promoting tree awareness in Britain. And there are more than 50 organizations that have been given support to this charter. And they are both environmental uh, uh, organizations, but also the religious ones, such as the Order of Arts, Ovates and Druids. So what the order has done is that they have formulated a statement in support uh, where they, uh, uh, they describe why they take part of this charter. Uh, and in this, they do in this again, that they refer back to the, the, the themselves as Oaksir, um, the, the autonomy of the word Druids. Um, and they establish and emphasize the relation between druidry and the protections of trees. Uh, but they are also very much um, uh, put themselves as modern druids. And this is from their statement in support. So I will read it. Uh, British druids today draw inspiration from that heritage. Still honoring trees and learning the many lessons. They have to teach, teach. Trees are, for us, far more than mere resources. They are spirits of the wild, counsel of, of the hearth, and guardians of the ages, worthy of respect and love. Defending Britain's woodlands and encouraging an ever closer relationship between people and the forest is, for us, therefore, a sacred charge. In this time of declining biodiversity, increasing urbanism and climate change, this charge is more important than ever. Uh, so if we would not be surprised to find this uh, in referencing to, to tree law, when we look at the statement in support from the Order of Bonds, it's we could, we could expect that, but the, if we look at the Charter of Trees on their web page, uh, they also offer a historical background uh, in looking back in, in the history of Britain. Uh, and in doing so, they also uh, write about how trees were, were treated different as sacred in, in ancient Britain. So I will quote here. Earlier Britons, Celts, Romans, Anglo-Saxons and Vikings all bring beliefs about the magical powers and sacred importance of forests, trees, plants and animals, end quote. Uh, so I think they also have a ring of, of Fraser in their, their describing this relation to trees and forests in, in ancient Britain. Um, but they also have this... Um, what they're really saying is that, that trees in this ancient traditions, uh, where trees are considered sacred, they were in, uh, to be seen as they were given a kind of respect that we seem to lack today. So I, uh, the, the, the order of bonds describe what they're doing themselves in terms of tree lore. Um, uh, so um, they, 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 they write uh, much about tree lore. Uh, there is also an uh, um, anthropologist of religion, Graham Harvey, who writes on druidy and tree lore. And he says that it is a complex system where each tree is, is associated with a particular mood, action, phase of life, deity or ancestor. Uh, and he also say that this is... Uh, it's a recent in origin, and it is in Harvey's word, quoting, an inspired response to the needs of the contemporary world. It draws whoever on aspects of folk tradition, story, and legend, combined with the knowledge of natural history, 
and traditional human usage of trees. Um, but I think also what is uh, what we can see when we talk about tree lore, which, which I refer to tree lore in the Anthropocene, is that it's not only folklore and legends and so on that are part of this, uh, how you see trees as animated. Because today we also have um, scientific biological theories, which is also resonate, re resonate with this. And for example, we have a German plant researcher known as, he, he's named Peter Wolleben, and he has written a book on uh, trees, the hidden lives of trees, what they feel, how they communicate, uh, discoveries from a secret word. He in, in introduced the, the, what he refers to as the wood wide web. Uh, and he says that, trees are able to communicate and coexist with its, uh, each other. And this is, he's a researcher, but his book was uh, reaching far beyond the scholarly world. And uh, he also was uh, a prize winning book. And we also have, of course, in Britain, we have the eco barrister, Paul Higgins, who is working for implanting ecocide in legal systems, uh, which is also a part of this uh, and there is also in a phil more philosophical, biological discussion, we have a person named uh, philosopher, biologist, Matthew Hall, uh, plant as person, and he says that we are very much shaped by what in Western world, what he calls zoocentrism. We care about animals and, and we care about humans, but we are less interested in, in plants and we ought to treat them with the same respect as, as other living creatures. So I would say that uh, modern tree lore is also drawing from this philosophical, legal and scientific perspective. And the interesting things is that it, it, it goes well with this animistic folklore uh, where trees are representing the larger than human world. Um, and it can merge into a modern form of tree lore. Uh, and we can also see that what is uh, what I doing is not simply worshiping. Uh, uh, and again, Graham Harvey, he refers to those as eco-pagans. Uh, and he writes, and I would say that, quoting, the natural history of trees will sooner or later reveal the extent of the destruction of trees, woodlands and forests, and the rich habitat they provide. In Druidy, this cannot remain simply an idea or awareness. It must be translated into some sort of action. And that is what he's saying, that some, so, some pagans are taking part of activism, and he addressed those as, as eco-pagans. So I'll come into my last slide, and this is not the conclusion. This is more kind of... Um, to sum it up in some some way, uh, because there is some in some say sense you can say that uh, worship of trees and modern tree lore are are, are similarities, and of course the the thing that is similar is that see trees are seen as animated, uh, and if we look at worship of trees in antiquity, uh, following. Um, Fraser, he would say that trees are animated and spirit may inhabit trees. Uh, and the, he also claimed that the worship of trees is natural because there is ri these rich woodlands. Uh, but he also saw worship of trees as magic superstition. And he saw that it was incompatible with science. And this was, a co of course, part of his evolutionistic scheme uh, where he posed the magic superstition um, as, as um, um, not less evaluated um, teams. Uh, and he saw them as primitive and different from religion. Uh, and when, if we look what I refer to modern tree lore in the Anthropocene, we can also say that trees are animated, uh, but rather than uh, that individual trees are inhibited by spirits. Trees are part of the larger than human world where everything is interconnected. Uh, and also 
tree lord is a response to the loss of forest and in increase in ecological crisis. Uh, and modern tree lord draws from science, from, for example, from biology and philosophy. And modern tree lore and paganism are alternative spirituality that is um, a part of modernity. So rather than worship, it is to make kin. Um, uh, if we would want to describe what is going on, I think Don Haraway's term to making kin is, is more uh, suitable um, to describe how people relate to trees than many ways people relate or druids relate to trees um, and also um, they are taking part of, of uh, environmental activism so that's the end of it